Hello everybody, back for another video review, and this is another one that uh, I grew up with and I'm actually kind of <laughs> anxious to have to talk about, and this is Masters of the Universe. Masters of the Universe uh, was released back in 1987, my birth year by the way, and honestly, of course, if anybody isn't uh, too uh, sure yet, I mean, obviously it's based on the toys and it's based on the cartoon series, which is called He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. This was a combined effort by Mattel and, of, of course, Canon to get a film adaptation made based off the, uh, based off the TV show and toys. <laughs> Masters of the Universe obviously is, well, it's pretty cut and dry. The head of Snake Mountain, Skeletor, has seized control of Grayskull Castle, and, or Castle Grayskull, and He-Man, his nemesis, tries desperately to defeat him, and uh, Skeletor pretty much le lays siege to the entire world of Eternia, with only a few Eternians left to battle, left to fight, and Ske and of course, they come him and his uh, He-Man and his allies come across a uh, being named Gwildor, who creates a, a device called the Cosmic Key that can open doors to any other points in the universe. And after a uh, near failed attack on Grayskull. He man and uh, his friends ultimately uh, open a door, manage to get a door open to another world. Unfortunately, they land on Earth, where eventually Skeletor and his minions ultimately follow and cease to retrieve the Cosmic Key, and so Skeletor can retrieve all the powers of Castle Grayskull. Yeah, I kind of spoke about the movie in a nutshell. There obviously are a little bit of subplots, like obviously there's uh, two humans that. Uh, they uh, help. They're uh, Julie and Kevin. Julie, by the way, is played by a young Courtney Cox. This was actually, I think this was her first feature-length movie. This was obviously long before she did Friends and long before uh, the Scream franchise. So basically, I kind of explained the plot of Masters of the Universe almost perfectly well. There's not really much to say about the plot. Case closed. End of story. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Masters of the Universe was the product of Canon and also the company that made the toys, Mattel. Mattel had been trying to... I mean, apparently they've wanted to do a... Mas I don't know if they wanted to do a Masters of the Universe movie. Or the movie came out around the time the, the commercial, the cartoon, the toys were at the height of their popularity. But also, uh, they were looking for the perfect studio to get a movie made, and they turned to canon. Well, actually, I want to say this all kind of started around the time... I want to say Masters of the Universe, this film's existence, is also owed to the success of the Superman franchise. So here's, here's, a, note, here's a quick backstory. In 1983, Superman 3 came out. And while it was a moderate hit, it wasn't as successful as the first two were. So the film's producers, Alexander and Ilya Salkin, basically felt that if they made a fourth movie, it wouldn't do as well. So, base, so they ended up giving $36 million and selling themselves out to Canon Pictures, and basically gave Canon $36 million to make Superman 4. Canon saw that money, and knowing the financial troubles they were in, ultimately decided to, believe it or not, take that money and make two separate films, one of them being Superman 4, The Quest for Peace, and the other being this movie. So, basically, you know, so they ended up making two separate films with the $36 million budget. And it looks like they put more effort into this movie because Superman 4 cost $17 million, and yet this one cost $22 million to get made. So it looks like they definitely put more effort into this movie than Superman 4. But unfortunately, that strategy of theirs... Uh, taking that massive amount of money and making two separate films, unfortunately, did not go over well. Neither film was a hit. They both flopped, and they were both met with horrific, review, horrific reviews by critics. Though Masters of the Universe didn't get the uh, the paltry end of the stick like Superman Four did, but it still was met with pretty harsh reception. I mean, of course, checking out Rotten Tomatoes website. <laughs> I know a lot of people don't like to judge movies based on the, the criteria that Rotten Tomatoes goes with, but Superman 4 had a 11%, I believe, last time I looked, and uh, Masters of the Universe has a 22. So obviously, you can tell the critics did not 
I mean, obviously, much of, and a lot of the criticism also came from fans that felt the film derided from the source material a lot. Like, first of all, a lot of the popular characters were excluded from the movie. I mean, yeah, we do get a few. We do get a few from the cartoon and the, and the toys in the movie, but there were a lot that were excluded. Um, one character that fans really were upset about was the loss of Orko, who was a popular character from both the cartoon and the toys. And he was replaced by the little guy Gwildor, playing the film by Billy Barty, who uh, was actually in a couple of films I already reviewed, Legend and Willow. So, naturally, people were upset about that. And they were like, really? You're going to introduce a new character in a movie that's based on this whole slew of toys? But, yeah, there, I mean, like I said, we do have a few. I mean, yeah, we got, for the Eternians, yeah, we got He-Man, we got Tila, we got Master at Arms. And for the Snake Mountain villains, yeah, we got Skeletor, we got Evil Lynn, we got the Beast Man. So we have a few. And there's a few new ones that were included that, well, maybe never been included before. I mean, I did watch the cartoon as a kid. I don't remember too much of it because I haven't seen it for a long time. I never really collected any of the toys. So, But the film's director, Gary Goddard, he actually wanted the film to be more like, uh, like the stuff that Jack Kirby came up with. And if anybody doesn't know who Jack Kirby is... He's probably one of the most influential comic book artists of this generation. Well, he's not around anymore, so it's it's a sad shame. But this guy was a true visionary. He was. And he actually wanted Jack Kirby to be involved with the Masters of the Universe movie, but unfortunately, Canon refused to let him get involved in any way. Has any elements of the film held hold up very well? There were there are a few. There's a few things that hold up well. I mean, for one thing, the special effects, well, yeah, they haven't aged all that well, but honestly, I think they look pretty good, and the visual effects in the film were done by four-time Oscar winner Richard Edlund, who uh, had won on uh, all three of the Star Wars films of the pat of the original trilogy, and also on uh, Rares of the Lost Ark, and he had been nominated for his work on Poltergeist and Ghostbusters, and he would eventually get nominated again for Alien 3. So having him as the helmer for the visual effects was a good decision. And the film's music by the great Bill Conti, which, by the way, I have a soundtrack on CD here for Masters of the Universe by Bill Conti. Uh, Bill Conti is probably best known for scoring the Rocky films, with the exception of the fourth one, because he didn't do that one. But, uh, yeah. Well, also, uh, Bill Conti, I believe, scored... Uh, yeah, he scored all the Rocky movies except for the fourth movie and uh, except for uh, the two Creed films. By the way, Creed three coming out next year for any Rocky fans. But yeah, this one, but this uh, score by... This soundtrack is pretty hard to locate. I was lucky to find this at a pretty cheap price. But yeah, honestly, the score is amazing. It sounds great. In fact, a lot of people have confirmed it's better than the movie itself. But yeah, I mean, it, like I said, and you get a, yeah, and Bill Conti, by the way, did win an Academy Award for Best Original Score for what movie he did, I couldn't remember, so. But yeah, the soundtrack is great. It's very good. It accompanies the movie perfectly. As for some of the acting, yeah, the uh, the story, and by the way, the screenplay was done by David O'Dell, who, by the way, uh, wrote The Dark Crystal for Jim Henson, if anybody didn't know that. <laughs> That's interesting. But yeah, some of the acting has some of the acting is kind of cheesy. I mean, I will say Dolph Lundgren, I think he was a good choice to play He-Man. He definitely looked the part. But a lot of people are like, yeah, he didn't really act the part. But nonetheless, but he's, I still think he did a great job. But without a doubt, if there was any one perfect scene stealer in the movie, it's Frank Langella's Skeletor. He killed it in that role. He was perfect as Skeletor. Any scene he was in, he just stole the he stole the show in every scene he has. He commanded, and he, and of course, you know, he was already a, uh, you know, a professional actor. He had been in tons of stuff prior to the movie, and and even to this date, he admits playing Skeletor is one of the, uh, is still to this day, one of his personal favorite film roles. And you know what? After watching him in the role, I think he did a great job. The other actors, I think, were decent. I mean, Courtney Cox wasn't too bad. Um, What's the guy's name that played her boy who played Kevin in the film? Uh, oh, I forget his name. Sorry. But, uh, oh yeah, I'm mentioning, uh, I was mentioning director Gary Goddard. Unfortunately, out of all his films, out of all the movies he directed, this is his one and only film credit as director. 
He never made another film after this. He did go on to work on a few theme park productions after this, but other than that, uh, nothing. He at one Gary Goddard at one point was friends with Brian Singer, who uh, went on to, uh, of course, direct the uh, X Men movies. And before he got into a lot of trouble, uh, also he actually got pointers from Gary Goddard on when he was uh, planning to work, when he was getting ready to start production on the first X Men movie. He asked Gary Goddard about any pointers since he made a movie that sort of had comic book references. Which, yeah, it's funny because a lot of people have referred to Masters of the Universe as a poor adaptation of the cartoon and the toys. But when I look at the movie now. It has like it's got like a it's like comic book written all over it. And Gary Goddard took more uh, you know, fascination with Jack Kirby more than anything else. It's not like he wanted to do a movie that, you know, was based more on the cartoon, but he took more references from Jack Kirby more than anything else. So that's why the movie kind of has that look to it instead of instead of everything else that it has. Um it did get recognized at the Saturn Awards. It picked up nods for like special effects, makeup, and it was a nominee for Best Science Fiction Film. And it won a uh, Special Achievement Award for uh, for Gary Goddard at the Saturns. And it did get nominated at the Razzies. Uh, Billy Barty picked up a nod for Worst Supporting Actor for playing Gwildor. And yeah, his performance was not exactly the best in the film. But still, you know, he did a great job. But I said, I think the best thing about the movie that holds up well to this day is the makeup effects. Frank Langella, you can't even tell that's really him as Skeletor. You really can't. But it's all the other creatures, too, that he uh, that work there. I mean, even Billy Barty's makeup as Gwildor I thought was great, too. So anyway, yes, the film came out, and unfortunately, it flopped, it bombed. And, of course, once it came out on home video, it suddenly became, it started to grow, a, it started to slowly but surely grow a cult following. And... And now the film has gotten a bit of a reevaluation, somewhat. I'm not saying a complete reevaluation, but somewhat, because nowadays people look back on the film pretty fondly. But yeah, when it first came out, it was not well received at all. It, like I said, it still currently has a 22% on Rotten Tomatoes, so there are still quite a few people that, st <laughs> that obviously don't like the movie at all. Um, and of course, after the film, well, you know, the funny thing is, Canon had all this stuff planned. They had a sequel plan for Masters of Universe. I mean, if anybody has seen the movie, there's a post-credit ending, which does hint at the possibility for a sequel. Uh, when they were hoping for Superman 4 to even be a big hit, and they had a sequel plan for that. They even had a Spider-Man movie planned. But all that stuff went away. All because this... And by the way, this movie was one of the, uh, the failure of this film and Superman 4... And the, the Toby Hooper film, Life Force, which came out a couple years before Masters did, which was also made on a tremendous budget, all three of those films flopped. And those were three of the biggest uh, catastrophes that did lead to Canon's failure and their eventual closure. Well, Masters of Universe 2 actually did have a script written, but eventually it... Uh, it ultimately got rewritten, and uh, it did eventually get made into a feature-length movie, which, uh, believe it or not, became this film, Cyborg, with Jean-Claude Van Damme. Yes, the Masters of the Universe sequel did eventually get made, but it was rewritten into this movie. And it's funny because I said the full title of the sequel was Masters of the Universe 2, Cyborg. Well, they took away Masters of the Universe, but left the Cyborg title, so that's what happened. Cyborg, uh, by the way, these two films, yeah, they don't have anything in common, besides Canon producing this one as well, and it was directed by the recently deceased Albert Payan. Albert, rest in peace, buddy, who just passed away a couple days ago. It's a real shame. But still, we're left with this movie. So, now that I've talked about the movie enough, uh, by the way, uh, I think the movie holds up pretty well, though I wouldn't, I, I strong, I would not recommend it as one of the best, but I, I still would recommend you give it a watch. But anyway, let me talk about the Blu-ray. The Blu-ray was released by Warner Brothers back in 2012 to commemorate the film's 25th anniversary. And honestly, the Blu-ray, it's not bad. It holds up pretty well. The video on the disc, honestly, it's pretty good for what it is, and of course, it's, there's the Blu-ray you can see i have to turn it a little bit there we go yeah sorry the glare coming from the camera but yeah that's the blu-ray pretty bland <laughs> main menu is pretty bland too it all all it shows is just the cover here this is actually one of the poster arts for the movie for back when it first came out so 
It's appropriate. The video quality on the disc is actually not bad. It borders on being sharp and it borders being grainy, but for a movie of this quality and age, it, it's appropriate and it holds up very well. So for the video, I would say a four out of five. The audio, it's basically presented in only, there's only one audio track to choose from, and it's a English 2.0 DTS. So basically, they took the, the Dolby Stereo track from the DVD and they just bumped it up to DTS, uh, DTS uh, Master HD Audio. And honestly, sounds pretty good for the most part. So overall, but I don't think it's as strong as the video. So I would say for the audio, I would probably give it a three and a half. But it still sounds pretty beefy for a 2.0 track, for the most part. So, you know, you don't have to crank the audio up too loud. I mean, it still sounds pretty good for a, uh, you know, just for a 2.0 track. But nonetheless, still, pro still follows the movie pretty well. For bonus features, there's not really a lot. It's basically the same batch of material that came from the DVD edition, which I used to own before I got the Blu-ray. And the DVD was really nice. I mean, at least it was finally, you were finally nice to get this call film finally there. But the Blu-ray... Yeah, same batch of extras. All you get is a uh, commentary with the film's director, Gary Goddard. And uh, his commentary is actually pretty informative to listen to. He definitely retains a good bit of memory. The commentary was recorded in like 2000 or 2001. And he actually retains a good amount of information about the movie. Also, you get the film's trailer. The DVD did have a couple of additional things, but they were like, you know, they kind of gave you like a profile of many of the characters from the movie. But it's really like... It's simple, like, text information you had to read on screen. There's nothing more. So, yeah, overall, the extras probably give it maybe a 2 out of 5. The commentary alone definitely makes a, makes a nice involvement for the movie, so it's nice to hear Gary Goddard talk about his own film. So the overall movie out of 5 stars, probably I'd give a 3.5. I mean, overall, it's a fun, it's a fun experience of a film. That yeah, there are plenty of cheesy moments littered throughout the movie, but there are a lot of moments in the film that I'm willing to overlook the cheesiness. But the other thing is the movie was made on a very tight schedule. Mattel and Canon wanted this film made as quick as they could get it done. And Gary Goddard, who did have little experience making films at the time, he, uh, like I said, they literally were breathing down the guy's neck, like making sure that the movie was going to happen and it was going to hit the deadline release as soon as possible and honestly i i don't know why movie i don't know why they do that i mean like they need to give the filmmakers and the film crew time to get these films made they can't just like rush them and this is what happens they rush the movie and look out look how it turned out and i can even tell during the movie i, I could even tell that the movie felt rushed i mean even during the movie's production there was actually a contest that mattel was throwing and there's this kid that actually won, and unfortunately, they had to literally fly him over to the movie set and hurry and quickly film the scene. And his, yeah, his grand prize, he was actually going to have a scene in the movie, and this just kind of happened at the last minute. And by the way, for anybody who didn't know who the kid was in the movie, he's this little pig-faced monster that is holding Skeletor's staff, and Skeletor just kind of yanks it out of his hand. He has like a quick, really quick scene that lasts for maybe a couple of seconds, but... It's, uh, you know, it is what it is. But nonetheless, though, I think the film holds up pretty well. Special effects still look pretty decent for their time. The makeup effects look great. Some of the acting is cheesy, and yet some of the actors did a great job in, in the film. Like I said, Frank Langella nailed it as Skeletor. Dolph Lundgren definitely fit the part as He-Man, and I think he did a fairly decent job for what he had. So, yeah, the Blu-ray itself, it's a, uh, yeah, it's a pretty decent, uh, release for the film so honestly i say it's recommended you can get it pretty it's like 13 bucks on amazon you can get it pretty cheap there but for the cyber monday sales you know it probably would go i don't know how much it is right now but still the like i said blu-ray is definitely worth a look and uh if you can find cyborg i would recommend that one too because that one's not too bad and the the film score is great and yeah, so the video is pretty solid. The audio, once again, is solid. The extras, while there's not much, but the commentary is very, uh, it's very informative, and it definitely fits the movie perfectly. So, overall, Masters of the Universe, I would definitely give this one a watch. So, that concludes this presentation. I hope you all enjoy it when you eventually watch it, and I hope you hit and like to, and subscribe to my channel. 
So until the next video, everybody take care and be safe.